So I'm Mr. Hanselman. I'm here to present Logan Hirsch. He's uh, a well, I had the honor to come to teach AP Physics and Capstone at places this year, in the middle of the year, and I uh, had an incredible group of Capstone students, including Logan and Max. And these students, were, I was very impressed with them to begin with. And one student in particular came up asking me questions about Bernoulli sequences and equations and higher mathematics than, than we actually get into in high school. <laughs> and I was pretty impressed with that as well. And so as the year went on, as the, the months went by, uh, I learned a lot more about Logan. I was more and more impressed with everything I learned. Uh, this student actually has worked in and audited a 500 level math course at the university while he was doing his research, which 500 level math course, if anybody's ever taken the upper level math courses at the college, is hard for a college student, let alone for a high school student. So very impressive that he was able to tackle that. And his research that he was working on um, was simulating some very, very useful optics. So without further ado, I'll let you introduce you to his research. All right, thank you, Mr. Hanneman. Um, so today I'd like to present on my um, senior research project working in an optics lab, a different one than Max, but another optics lab down at the bio Research Institute at the U of A. And um, today I will be discussing um, my project of investigating optical devices and studying their sensitivity for the purpose of single molecular detection. Um, and specifically using a computer software tool known as ComSol to simulate these optical devices. So, let's see. Okay, so as an introduction, um, I worked as, at an internship at the Bio5 Research Institute uh, with an optics lab. And my interest was inspired by uh, some of the prerequisite classes I took at BASIS for Physics C, where we were introduced with electromagnetism, magnetism, and Modern physics, where we learned a little bit about quantum um, and light pop light propagation, which is very important topics in optics. And also, the main professor in my lab, Dr. Judith Su, is very inspirational orator, speaker, and a prolific writer of research. So she um, wrote about the application of micro resonator technology, which is the which are the optical devices they use in the lab, um, and their applicability for detecting single molecular, single molecules using light frequency and the properties of these uh, optical devices. And so this was the building I worked in and this is just some optical devices and a s optical experimental setup. Okay. So my formal research question was using computer simulation software, could I accurately model and study the sensitivity of optical devices um, that can be used for single mole molecular detection. And what I was working with was ComSol, which is a software tool that allowed me to um, build three models of three different devices they use in the lab. Uh, a glass micro disc, a glass micro toroid, and a glass micro ring, which um, the reason why we're simulating these devices is because it's less expensive and less time consuming than actually fabricating the devices and setting up an experiment to actually study properties we can learn from these devices um, with an experimental reference um, using simulation tools. So a little background in optical theory is whispering gallery mode theory. To understand the general shape of these devices, they all have a circular uh, shape for light to travel in. And this is because sound and light waves minimize energy loss when they're reflecting on the boundary of a circular object. And this property was first discovered in St. Paul's Cathedral in, I believe, the 16th century, where whispers, because uh, sound energy is minimized, the sound um, intensity is maximized by reflecting on the barriers of the wall. So people can actually hear whispers along the walls, is what was where the name came from. Um, so now I'm going to talk about. Uh, background into the main device they fabricate in the lab, which is the glass, silica glass microtorin resonator. So this device actually can just be thought of as a glass donut. It just looks like this donut here, and it has a simplistic, but it has an ideal shape for an ultra-sensitive biosensor. And this is because um, it, it, is a, it has a circular path for light to travel along the donut shape, so the light energy is minimized. So we have 
uh, light energy losses are minimized. So basically all the light is, can be confined in this object and it will remain in the object. Um, over here shows the system. Uh, you have an optical fiber sending light to, the, to our uh, toroid or our donut and light, the light intensity gets maximized when it is confined in the ring and then it returns to the output fiber. And an important uh, property of this device is that it has a resonance condition. There's only discrete values of frequencies of light that will actually uh, cause all the light to be confined in this ring. And it's according to this equation, m lambda equals n times the circumference of your toroid. So let me explain a little terminology that I was interested in studying was the quality factor, or in other words, the sensitivity of these devices. Um, mathematically speaking, it's the ratio of light energy stored in a cavity uh, compared to the light energy loss. And light energy can be lost in a device based off of the material roughness of the de device um, or thermal energy produced from just the, the heat created from the light. Um, and all you need to know is that a higher quality factor means it has, the device has higher sensitivity and therefore it's, a better, it's better at detecting um, frequencies. And this demonstration shows um, a graph of the intensity of light in your cavity and your, frequ uh, and your frequency of light. And this is a resonance condition. So this is a discrete, it's around a discrete frequency of light where the energy confined in the cavity is maximized. And as you can see, a larger quality factor contributes a steeper peak. And this means we have a more precise measurement of our resonance frequency condition. And over here demonstrates um, the property that when you bind a molecule to such a device, it results in a frequency shift. And if we have a higher quality factor or a higher sensitivity, we can more precisely detect this frequency shift. And therefore we can um, detect the uh, characteristic mass of a, of a molecule and therefore identify an unknown sample of a certain biomolecule bio based off of its mass. So that's how the re micro toroid resonator works pretty much. So, so let me reiterate how exactly the micro toroid is used as a biosensor. Um, so as I said before, it has a super high sensitivity. So there's minimized energy losses in the system. The light gets confined in the donut and it doesn't escape. Um, and, but only for discrete frequencies of laser light shot through the optical fiber will actually result in the light being confined in that cavity. Therefore, when a molecule is bound to such a cavity, let's say the molecule is bound on the outside of this glass ring, um, there's a frequency shift due to the addition of this mass. So to bring it into um, overall terms, uh, basically measuring, measuring a accurate frequency shift allows us to detect a molecule based off of its mass. Because the frequency shift corresponds to a specific mass increase. Okay, so let me uh, describe the software I used. It's called COMSOL. It's a multi-physics software that can apply physics modules to 2D and 3D geometries in order to study the dynamic properties of the system. And for, for my studies, I was interested in light propagation. So I was using an electromagnetic module to study light propagation, quality factor, which can study the sensitivity of the device based off of simulating the materials, the material losses, and um, thermal, thermal production, and also the resonance conditions, which frequencies will actually be sustained in the cavity and light will propagate um, in, within the cavity. And how, how COMSOL solves uh, the light propagation is actually it solves Maxwell's equations using uh, the finite element method, which divides a larger geometry into a mesh of smaller regions, and it solves the Maxwell's equations over each individual region to um, create a graphical profile of our light intensity and our electric field profile of our um, light in our cavity. So this can give us information about our sensitivity too. So let me just give a brief um, overview of my of the interface. This is what COMSOL looks like. As you can see, we can define materials that we want to use. For my studies, I was 
defining um, glass as the material of our resonators. And obviously the background that could vary as water or air, but these materials have differing refractive indices, which can um, affect our light propagation. Um, also, this is just the, the module I use that studies the frequency domain. It can study the frequencies of light that can survive in our cavity. And mesh is just the, how, it, how it solves the, the system, basically. It can divide your geometry into smaller regions, and then it solves the region. And depending on how good your mesh is, it will affect the resolution of um, your electric field profile, which over here is the graphical output. And this is um, basically it shows where the light is confined in your cavity, as you can see here. And the darker regions indicate a higher intensity of light. And um, using, the elect uh, using the frequency domain module, or the electromagnetic frequency domain module, we can, it outputs the frequencies that um, uh, result in light being confined in your device. And it also, yeah, and this is shown here. This is the frequency of light that survives in this cavity. So, so this is actually my um, model for the glass microtorin. It is a 3D model, and this kind of gives a better demonstration of what mesh looks like. It divides your shape into uh, your geometry into smaller subsections. Um, but this can be imagined as a donut if you consider this as a 2D cross section and rotate it around um, the y-axis. Um, it turns into a cylindrical donut, and I define this region as glass and this region as air. And what the frequency domain module does is it solves for the eigenfrequencies of the cavity, so the discrete values of light that can actually survive. And for ComSol, it actually outputs these frequencies with a real and imaginary component, and this is because the real component or the imaginary component of the frequency corresponds to um, energy losses in the system. And this allows us to investigate the sensitivity based off of the ratio of our real component of frequency and our imaginary, which is the loss. And so what, what I was interested in studying was um, something they do in the lab um, to actually uh, functionalize the device. And functionalization is basically modifying the surface to bind a specific mo molecule. Um, for the purpose of, if you want to bind a specific protein, if you're looking for a specific protein and studying a protein, you need to have the, the surface of your device coated with its corresponding antibodies, so the protein will bind. But if you're looking to study DNA, for instance, you need to bind corresponding conjugate nucleotide base pairs to bind that DNA. However, adding this functionalized layer to your device reduces the quality factor and the sensitivity of the device. So I was interested in looking exact, just exactly how much quantitatively does our detection sensitivity decrease when we add this functional layer. Um, and then they could use this as an experimental model. And this just demonstrates a surface and a, a functionalized uh, a certain bio layer added to functionalize the surface. So here are the results of my functionalized microtorid. Over here you can see in my model, um, we zoomed in on the microtorid on the right side because the light is confined on the right side. And this can be considered our functional layer on the edge here. Um, so what I could do with ComSol is I could uh, actually adjust the thickness of that layer and the refractive index of the layer and see how that affects the sensitivity. So as you can see here, a reasonable thickness for this layer in the lab, they said, was around 5 to 20 nanometers, so relatively thin, and so it only caused a 5% decrease in the sensitivity of this device. And over here, uh, if we increase the refractive index, we can see a more significant drop-off um, as we continue to increase our refractive index of that layer, which can result in 30% decrease in sensitivity. And this, these, this uh, data is useful because it can be used to simulate if they know exactly the refractive index or approximately how thick their functional layer is, then we can approximate just by how, how, uh, how accurate our detection is of the, the mass of our molecule we're looking at. And so um, to accurately detect a molecule, 
um, if our de if our sensitivity is decreased, then we're going to need a larger sample to accurately detect that molecule. So this can be used as a theoretical reference for that. And the reason why is because actually, as I said, the func uh, the functional layer cause causes more interference with light. And we can see that because either increasing the thickness or the refractive index will cause the light to leak further into that layer. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the ring resonator model. And this is just a 2D model of the same system of the microtorid with an optical fiber. Um, the op this is the optical fiber shooting light into the cavity, into our ring, and then returning to the output of this fiber. And I was interested in studying the resonance conditions and the coupling distance trends. And what the coupling distance trend is basically, if you have your optical fiber and your, uh, your ring, then we actually, the distance between these two devices will affect just how well the light gets confined in the cavity. So I wanted to study that property too, because there's actually a critical distance in which light will optimize its um, confinement in the cavity. So here are my results from that. So this was sweeping the wow. frequencies of light that could um, be shot in, through the fiber. And as we can see, our, we have our peak points. Um, these are our resonance conditions, these peak values. That's because um, this is actually measuring the absorption or the transmission of light in the output of the fiber. And when that is minimized, we have a maximized, maximization of the uh, light in the actual ring. So we can see our resonance conditions at discrete values at 1550 nanometer light, 1515 nanometer light, and around 1585 nanometer light. And there's a periodic trend of every 40 nanometers of light uh, will sustain in the cavity. And over here it shows the coupling distance. So um, as we see, when they're, when they're too close together um, over in this area, the devices are too close together, and it's something called overcoupling. The light actually doesn't confine as well when they're too close. But as we keep on sweeping, at around 10 to 15 nanometers, we once again get the maximization of light energy sustained in our cavity. But as we continue to separate these devices, the light will no longer be able to reach the, the device, and that's why it approaches zero um, light in the cavity. So now I wanted to do, I did one more uh, investigation with the ring resonator to kind of study the um, mass loading effect of using these resonators as a detector. So on the left side we have our, um, just the ring resonator, and on the right side we have our ring resonator but with a glass particle um, bound to it to see just how it affects the, our resonance frequency conditions. Um, here are the results from here. Are this is the previous uh, transmission of light at 1550, 1515, and 1585. But as we can see, we can clearly, distinctively see a frequency shift when the with for the ring resonator with the silica particle for this uh, dotted transmission, and it shows around 1542 nanometer is a resonance condition, and 1518, and this happens to be an eight nanometer shift. Uh, in our resonance frequency condition. Um, and so we can actually correspond that frequency shift to the mass density of that particle. And that's how we can detect a molecule based off of its um, frequency shift in our system and correspond that to the mass of that molecule. And just to demonstrate just how I used the same model but added a more massive particle, instead of it being glass, I used a gold particle to demonstrate we have a more significant shift with um, a larger mass. As you can see, our resonant frequency conditions um, occur at 1540 now, 1515, so they are um, shifted by 10 nanometers, which is expected. So this can also be used potentially, um, we could further investigate this to exactly uh, correspond the density of our particle to the frequency shift of caused by adding our particle to the device. Um, so in conclusion, I learned to navigate and use a multi-physics software tool, ComSol.
I learned, um, obtained data on light propagation in various optical devices and how the mass loading effect can be graphically demonstrated with um, frequency shifting. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to keep working into the summer and uh, especially for personal insight, I learned how to collaborate in such a setting with graduate students and um, uh, continue to use these skills I've learned in uh, more uh, research settings as I continue. And this just happens to be some fun pictures where I got to participate in a, in a, uh, a team event, uh, Hot Thought, which was <laughs> <laughs> something I've never tried before. <laughs> so that was really fun. And so thank you, thank you everyone for listening and special thanks to these people for making this possible. Um,